So we're going to talk about the lung and the chest wall. First, we're going to go over compliance again. So compliance, this term is the same for the respiratory system as it is in the cardiovascular system. So do you remember what was compliant in, in, for both of these systems, basically? Compliance, or what was the equation for it? Compliance was equal to the change in volume, change in volume over change in pressure. Okay. Remember, this is just a measure of how stretchy something is. How stretchy is this lung? How distensible it is? The more compliant, the more distensible the lung is. Now, the other thing to know is that compliance and elasticity are inversely co correlated. The more elastic something is, the, more, the less distensible. The way you think about this is think about a thick rubber band. And think about that. The more thick tissue there is, the harder it is to stretch. The less distensible, the more it snaps back. Okay, the more snapping power, snapping force it has. Okay. Now, when we look at these pressure volume curves on this right, so it's volume versus pressure. Um, this basically shows you the relation, whether the lung chest system as a whole will want to expand or collapse. It's going to be based on the forces of the lung and the chest and it's, it's a combination of the both. Now, the slopes of these curves represent compliance. We just said compliance equals to volume over pressure, so that's the slope. Okay. Now, we see again that, first of all, the, the chest wall normally has a tendency to expand. As you can see, the chest wall compliance, this green stuff, is mainly on the left side of this curve here, okay? Because the chest wall likes to expand. The only exception to this is at very high volumes we see that the chest wall will actually want to collapse a little bit because the volume is too high on the other hand the lung pretty much always wants to collapse okay as you can see the lung this yellow curve here is always on the right of this so there's always a collapsing force on the lung lung wants to collapse chest wall usually wants to expand so what your you have to think of your lung and chest wall though as a system they have to go together so where they will go will depend on the balance between the two. And we're going to look at what they're going to do at different volumes. So let's erase this. We're going to start at functional reserve capacity. That's the first volume. What Do you remember what, what kind of volume was this? Remember, remember this was the, vol the volume of air after, basically after you take a, a normal expiration, you finished expiring, what's going to happen? Where is your lung and chest wall? What are they going to do? Well, if you look at the the curve for the chest wall and then the curve for the lung, you take the, 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 basically the average between the two, the middle, you look at the middle, and you look here, you see there's exactly zero airway pressure. There is no expanding or collapsing force. So your lung and chest wall system is, is very happy here. It would, this is equilibrium point, okay? However, if your lung volume is below functional residual capacity, for example, the patient forcibly expired additional air, what is going to happen? We see now that the average, the middle between the chest wall and the lung compliance is right here. Okay. And at this point, is there going to be an expanding or a collapsing force? We see that when, we, when our, our lung and chest wall system is below the functional residual capacity, it wants to expand. And that makes sense. If we push out some air, your lung is want to get, want, going to want to expand and fill it up, fill up a little bit more air. Okay. And then if we look at uh, the other example, if we look, go above the functional residual capacity, that means the patient takes in air, then what's going to happen? Again, we look at the average, let's say right here. We look at the, the average between these two. We're going to add them up. Okay. And so now we basically, so there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You add up here. So you see now that the main force here is a collapsing force on our lung chest wall system. So we took in air. Now our, lung, our, now our system wants to go back to equilibrium, which is at the functional resi residual capacity, so it's going to want to collapse. So that's pretty much the gist for this whole chart right here. Okay. Again, chest wall wants to expand, lung wants to collapse. What your system, what your combined chest wall lung is going to do is going to depend on the balance between the two. Okay. Now we're going to talk about lung compliance a little more, because normally, this is our lung compliance. We just saw here this... Or actually, this yellow, this yellow one is our lung compliance. 
and this is here, this is the normal, this is the yellow that we saw in the previous slide. However, diseases can change this lung compliance, okay? Emphysema is one disease. It's a disease with loss of elastic fibers. And what do we say? What would happen to lung compliance if you lose elastic fibers? Remember, the two are inversely related. So loss of elastic fibers leads to increased lung compliance, okay? You lo remember, let's say your lung was like a thick rubber band, but you, remove, you, you made it a little thinner because you lost elastic fibers. So it's now more stretchable, more extensible. It's more compliant. Now, how will functional residual capacity change? So, because you just lost, you have better compliance now, the lung will have a decreased collapsing force, okay? Meanwhile, the, the chest tendency to expand, what's going to happen to the chest tendency to expand? It's going to remain the same. It has nothing to do with the amount of elastic fibers in the lung. So, less, um, less collapsing force, greater tendency to expand, what's going to happen? Patient is now going to have a higher functional residual capacity, okay? Next, in pulmonary fibrosis, what's going to happen is the tissue of the lung are stiffened, so they're less distensible. So what's going to happen to compliance? Lung compliance decreases, as you see here. This is the volume of the pressure again. See the lower slope means it's lower compliance. Okay, so how will functional residual capacity change here? We see, we see that the lungs will have a greater tendency to collapse because they have decreased compliance. Okay. Meanwhile, the chest wall tendency, what's going to happen to it is a tendency to expand. It's going to remain the same again. So what's going to happen? Basically, your functional residual capacity is going to decrease because there is a greater tendency to collapse from the lungs. And so your function, the way they balance out is going to be at lower volumes. So you have a decreased functional residual capacity. Decreased functional capacity here, increased functional residual capacity. Okay. Now we'll look at changes in the respiratory system for the elderly. Elderly have an atrophy of, of respiratory muscles and loss of elastic tissue. Loss of elastic tissue is going to, what's going to do to your compliance. Remember, it's going to increase compliance and, what, and it's also going to lead to increased air trapping. Okay. Air is going to, you have alveoli here. And then because you have less elastic tissue, it can't collapse as much. So the air just hangs out here. Thus, what's going to happen? Again, we said increased compliance. You get decreased compliance of the chest wall. Why would that be? Because you're going to get stiffening from calcification of the rib cage. Okay. Finally, what is the air trap? I told you about air trapping. What is that going to do to your residual volume? If you have increased air trapping, you're going to get increased residual volume because air is just going to hang out, and that's air that you can't you can't forcibly breathe out. Now I'm going to tell you that total lung capacity is going to remain the same. So in that case, the total lung capacity remains the same. Then forced visual, residual capacity must decrease because of the increased air trapping. So the amount of air that you can forcibly push out is going to decrease. Your FEV1, which is the amount of air you can push out in one second, is also going to decrease. Now other changes in the in the respiratory system for elderly people are, first of all, increased VQ mismatch. Basically means there's a mismatch between your ventilation, which is V, and, and perfusion of blood, which is Q. Okay, so that's going to lead to an increased AA gradient, which is the gradient, which is the amount of oxygen in your alveoli and the oxygen in your arterioles. So it's the amount of oxygen that can go from your alveoli all the way to the arterioles. So you have Im impairment of this in elderly patients. We're going to talk more all a lot more about VQ gradient A, VQ mismatch and AA gradients later. Next, we also see decreased respiratory muscle strength. Again, we said there's atrophy of respiratory muscles that leads to decreased muscle strength. So, normally, we see that basically the respiratory system in the elderly is not as good as normal. However, normally elderly people don't have any trouble breathing. However, they have less res respiratory reserve. So, if they suffered a respiratory insult, for example, pneumonia or something, they're going to be more at risk than a person, than a young, healthy person like you or I. Okay, because they have less respiratory reserve due to all these three factors. They increase compliance, decrease compliance in the lungs, decrease compliance in the chest wall, increase compliance in the lungs. They have that VQ mismatch, they have decreased respiratory muscle um, strength. Alright, so that's it for this lecture.